This is the Al Franken Show on Sirius XM Progress 127. Hey, everybody, we got a uh, great one for a change. And let me tell you what's great about it. As you know, I almost always have experts on. And two of my experts today are experts on being very smart and very thoughtful teenagers in Texas. Rajat Gulhati and Anna Brooks both just graduated from Tom DeLay High School in Sugarland, Texas. That's it's not the name of, of, of the high school, but they did just graduate from high school in Sugarland, uh, which is a suburb of Houston and which Tom DeLay represented for 20 years in Congress, where uh, for a few years he was the Republican House Majority Leader and resigned uh, after being indicted uh, for criminal conspiracy to violate election law. Which is a little ironic because the reason Rajat and Anna are, are with me is that Rajat emailed me to tell me that he wanted to vote by mail this November because of uh, COVID-19. He and Anna are very passionate about politics and public policy, and they like to vote by mail so they don't expose themselves to, to the coronavirus. But the Texas governor... Greg Abbott and the Texas state legislature don't want Roger and Anna to vote by mail because they suspect that Roger and Anna are up to something. Uh, they think there's a good chance that Roger and Anna are going to commit voter fraud and steal the election for Joe Biden and down ticket Democrats. See, right now in Texas, the law is that you can vote absentee or vote by mail only if you're over 65 or have some medical condition that might make you vulnerable to uh, dying from COVID-19. And it turns out that uh, Governor Abbott is, uh, like Donald Trump, something of a genius about keeping COVID-19 under control. And when Abbott opened the state prematurely, he made sure to prohibit mayors and county officials around Texas from requiring uh, that their citizens wear masks out in public. Well, uh, now it turns out that there's been an enormous spike in COVID cases in the Lone Star State, and the ICUs in Houston are, are now packed beyond capacity. So Governor Abbott has reversed himself and is closing the state down and encouraging local officials around the state to require that their citizens wear masks in public in order to slow the spread of the deadly virus. Now, does that mean that Abbott and the state legislators uh, want Texans under 65 to be able to vote by mail? Uh, no, no. And, and, and that's because of all the fraud that we have seen in, for example, the five states that have 100% voting by mail. And the fraud in those states has been actually zero or incredibly close to zero. So I decided to bring Mark Elias, the National Democratic Party's lead election lawyer, who is uh, representing some other teenagers in Texas, to win their right to cast their votes in the November election by mail. And he has a, a very good case because of the 26th Amendment uh, to the Constitution, which says, the right of citizens of the United States who are 18 years of age or older to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of age. Well, if... The difference between being able to vote by mail is your age. That seems to be an abridgment on account of age. I'm not a lawyer, but I played one in a sketch. And I was on the Judiciary Committee for eight years. So I will get Roger and, and Anna and Mark Elias. Uh, I'll get to them in a bit. But first, I want to talk a little bit about the election which is uh, four months away now. And right now, Texas is in play. Biden is actually a head, a small lead in, in Texas in some polls, which is very bad news for Donald Trump. And I have a, a few thoughts that I'd like to share with you on, on all of this. When your opponent is digging himself a hole, you let him keep digging. 
Now, by design or necessity, Joe Biden has laid low since we all started sheltering in place, allowing Donald Trump to turn the November election into a referendum on Donald Trump. And right now, Donald Trump appears to be losing very badly to Donald Trump. Now, given Trump's inability to admit and learn from mistakes, there is the real possibility that he will continue to crash and burn all the way uh, through November 3rd. But Biden and the Democratic Party cannot count on that. And they must offer the American people a real rationale for voting in the fall for three reasons. The first one, of course, is, is that a Trump victory would be a disaster for everything Democrats hold dear. Here's a short list. Democracy, uh, economic justice, social justice, and justice. Okay, that leaves out a whole bunch. For instance, providing health care for all Americans and global warming, you know, stuff like that. Secondly, between now and November, Trump and the Republicans will do everything they can to cheat. That means suppressing every vote possible, using every tool at their disposal, including deliberately or not keeping the pandemic going great guns through the election while preventing Americans uh, from voting by mail, which is today's topic. Third, if Trump loses a close election, he will not leave. Biden has to win by a lot, and to do that and carry Democrats to a majority in the Senate, he has to offer Americans a vision of what America can be. Now, polling shows that in the three-plus years that Donald Trump has been in office, Americans have, ironically, lost the sense that America is great, that we are exceptional, that we are still the world's indispensable nation. Now, it's not that Americans don't want us to be that, but just looking around, most Americans think that we're just no longer up to it, especially right now. As uh, George Packer discussed with me, uh, the pandemic has laid bare weaknesses that already existed, a, a dysfunctional and corrupt federal government, a hopelessly divided political class unable to address problems that we used to be able to tackle, like our like our crumbling infrastructure, or more immediately, providing personal protective equipment to our frontline healthcare workers, an economy in which most workers deemed essential are paid barely enough to get by, racial disparities in, in income, wealth, and healthcare, and, and in criminal justice. Internationally, we have ceded our leadership, made alliances with brutal dictators and alienated our allies. The Kurds lost 11,000 men and women fighting ISIS on our behalf in Syria, only to be abandoned by Donald Trump, a, a move he justified <laughs> by pointing out that the Kurds had not been at Normandy. Well, you know who was at Normandy? Our big NATO ally, Germany. Hell, if it weren't for the Germans... There would be no D-Day. We'd never, we wouldn't be able to celebrate that. Uh, last week, Trump whiffed on the ultimate softball question when Sean Hannity asked him what he hoped to accomplish in a second term. Actually, he didn't whiff. He took a third strike <laughs> that was lobbed waist high over the heart of the plate. He had nothing, nothing. Zero goals for a second term. Joe Biden needs to remind Americans what leadership is supposed to look like. Worldwide, we need to engage our allies if we are to challenge China's emergence as the world's preeminent superpower. Domestically, we have to restore Americans' confidence in our ability to solve problems and make progress. The vast majority of Americans want to build on, uh, on Obamacare and not, not abandon it. We want our government agencies run by competent professionals, not crooked cronies. 
We want a system of taxation that rewards work, not capital, and that raises enough revenue to meet the needs of American families. We, we want to meaningfully address the systemic racism that has been our country's shameful legacy for 400 years. We want an educational system that works for every American child and every adult who wants to further herself in a 21st century economy. We want roads and bridges and trains which at least resemble those in other developed countries. We want a president who can not only answer Sean Hannity's softball question, but also inspire us with his answer. We are America. Not so long ago, that meant something. We are capable of restoring our place in the world and of being a nation that remembers that, as Paul Wellstone put it, we all do better when we all do better. Joe Biden is not Franklin Roosevelt, but he is Joe Biden, a fundamentally decent man who could begin healing some of the divisions that this president has deliberately exploited and deepened. He is a man of deep empathy who would inherit a wounded nation from a man incapable of caring about anyone other than himself. But first, Biden has to win, which means he has to bring it. Whoa, I'm glad I got that off off my chest. Okay, a couple matters of business before we get to Mark Elias and our Texas teenagers. First of all, the raffle to win a virtual cocktail party with me and Sarah Silverman, and this is to help black and brown owned businesses uh, that sustained damage during the civil disorders in the Twin Cities, help them get back on their feet. You can go to alfranken.com to get all the details. Okay, now we're going to go to my conversation with Rajat Gulati and Anna Brooks, and uh, then we'll be joined by super lawyer Mark Elias. What are you guys doing next year? Are you planning to go to college, or is this a year not to go to college? This is a gap year. A lot of people taking gap years. A couple of people are, but I kind of need to go. Like, I need to get out of the house. <laughs> if you know what I mean? Okay. So, do you know where you're going? Uh, yeah, UT Austin. So, UT Austin, that's a great school. And Anna, where are you going? To Texas A&M. Oh, that's a, that's a great school, too. Where do you guys live in Texas? We live in the Sugarland area right outside of Houston. Sugarland. Okay. I, I've heard of it. I, I don't know exactly where it is, but I know where Houston is. If it kind of helps you like visualize like our like town or neighborhood, do you know like Tom DeLay? Have you've heard the name? Uh, yeah, of course. That's our district. He used to represent us. Okay, and has the demographic changed since DeLay left, or is it the same? I think it's changed quite a bit. It's a swing district now. Yeah, yeah. He was a jerk. <laughs> I mean, he had this talk about elections and gerrymandering, and he was a king of that. Yeah. Yeah, he was a bad guy. And part of the, what's happened to the Republican Party and what's happened to Congress, which is so divided now. Well, you mentioned in your book that like you were able to like form close relationships with like people across the aisle. Did that like help like I don't know reduce the divisiveness that you saw? Yes and no. I mean, there were certain issues, you know, that weren't that partisan that you could get some agreement on. Crisis intervention training, which is training for police to recognize when they're confronting a situation that is energized by mental illness. But that was that was kind of it. You know, when I, I first got there, uh, a number of the veteran senators said to me, this is the worst it's ever been. And, and it just got worse from there. Oh, wow. They don't do anything now but confirm <laughs> right-wing judges. They, they can't. They just don't do anything. They passed the emergency bill, to, which has some good things in it. I guess I did that. The, the president on testing is so, so awful because what we do need is more testing and more contact tracing. For sure. You know, that's, that's how we do this. And the fact that we haven't ramped that up is crazy. And then the way he said in Tulsa about, like, 
we have more cases, we have more testing. <laughs> so I'm thinking of stopping the testing is, uh, you know, that that is so irresponsible and so stupid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry about about our government guys. I'm sorry about our <laughs> my generation and what we've left you. So do you have any idea what you guys want to major in, what you want to do with your lives? I'm majoring in engineering. Um, the way AM's engineering program works is that you're admitted to a specific type of engineering your sophomore year, and I'm hoping to take the biomedical route. My son majored in mechanical engineering, and then he got his master's in it. And one thing, Anna, you should know about this, is you have to retain everything you learn because the knowledge in engineering, you have to rely on what you've already known. It builds on on itself as opposed to in the liberal arts. You can just forget whatever you learned right away. Uh, Roger, uh, any, any idea yeah. what you're going to be doing? Um, so I am going into the liberal arts, so I will be forgetting everything I've learned <laughs> going in. I doubt that, actually. What What, what are your but, interests other than politics? So right now, I'm kind of interested in, like, international relations and, like, government. So that that is my passion. I used to really want to work for the State Department. Um, I don't know if you've ever read the book Hard Choices by Hillary Clinton. I read that when I was really young, and it just got me really passionate about it partly because she was passionate about the topic and it made it seem so interesting to me. But barring that, it would also be cool to like go into national security or something like that. So working for the Central Intelligence Agency would also be on my list as well. How do you feel about the country? Because when I grew up, I grew up in the 50s and 60s. I was your age in 1969, okay? This was post-World War II. Our economy was expanding, our middle class was expanding, and, and we, we felt that this was the American century. Let me ask you this. Do kids these days, and I call you kids because you're kids, uh, kids these days, do you feel like America is the leader of the world, that we're the indispensable nation? If it were up to me to answer that question, honestly, I would say that oftentimes I can't really find myself feeling very patriotic just because of everything that's been going on, but not just recently. Ever since I've been alive, it's weird. I hear people in my parents' generation talk about how, oh, we're the best country in the world. For me, I'm, I'm gonna be honest, I hope we're still the indispensable nation. I think we are an exceptional country, but you need to earn that right. You don't, you're not just given it like because you're America, you earn it because of the way that we behave as a nation. And I think we're kind of losing that. Where do you feel like uh, in the last three plus years are standing in the world, how that's doing. In my personal opinion, we've definitely lost a lot of our prestige. Our president has to project kind of like an, an idea of what America is, an inclusive, diverse America. And I don't think we're doing that right now. And I think... You don't think Trump is, is doing that, is projecting the <laughs> I ideals of American democracy? Exactly. I mean... Huh. Inclusivity, diversity, and just overall commitment to freedom like and democracy are like co cornerstones of what America's seen around the world. And I think we're starting to lose a lot of that. And we're starting to lose the moral high ground. And I don't think that's ever a, a high ground that you want to give up. Normally, I have experts in these things, like a, like a foreign policy expert from Brookings. But I think it's really good to be talking to you and seeing what just 18-year-olds who are interested in this are, are seeing for themselves. Now, no 18-year-old is listening to this who isn't interested in this stuff, I have the feeling. So uh, I, can, I can say that, and no one's going to go, hey, man, I'm offended. <laughs> I was doing a teenager from 1968. <laughs> <laughs> I guess one last thing, this spike in, in COVID in Texas, how are people in Texas reacting to this in terms of, uh, is, is it still a big partisan divide or uh, is, are, are, are there just people going like, okay, we screwed up. We screwed up. Yeah, Let's I would say that it's still probably very a partisan divide here. I don't yeah. know how they managed to turn a global health crisis into a partisan issue, but they did. 
And I think that's part of the reason why the mail-in ballot issue is so important, because when you think about it, it's not a partisan issue. It should be a people's issue. Everyone should be able to exercise their right to vote and not be afraid that in doing so, they'll be putting their loved ones at risk. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's something Anne and I really wanted to actually stress. This doesn't need to be between Democrats or Republicans, liberals or conservatives. I mean, we all we all believe in democracy. And I, I don't see why this needs to even be an issue personally. OK, we're going to bring Mark Elias, the lead Democratic lawyer uh, here. We're going to have him on to explain this. He has the case that you're interested in, which is to allow you to vote by mail in November. Uh, There was a recent decision in the Supreme Court that was reported in a very confusing way. It made it seem that the Supreme Court had made a final decision on this issue, but they didn't. Uh, Do you know anyone who who found that that reporting confusing? I did. Okay. (laughs) So when we come back from this break, uh, let's go to my friend Mark Elias, the lead Democratic election lawyer, and we'll get to the bottom of this and see how we can get uh, you two to vote by mail in in Texas in November so you don't get infected and and kill your your grandparents. Uh, Mark, uh, I was talking to Rajat and and Anna about the court decision, the unanimous decision, and kind of explained what you had explained to me. So why don't you go over that again, what that was, because I asked them if they misunderstood it, and misinterpreted what had happened, and Roger said, I did. <laughs> so. Yeah. So, so think of it this way. Um, the case that went to court was one of several cases that are have been filed that relate to the same set of issues, right? So we're talking about the ability of voters under the age of 65 years old to request and cast a mail ballot in Texas elections. And just so that everyone's on the same page in Texas, unless you are um, over the age of 65, you need one of various kinds of excuses in order to cast a mail ballot. There are several lawsuits pending that challenge this, saying that this violates the 26th Amendment, which is the amendment that guarantees that those over the age of 18 are not discriminated based on age in voting. So one of those cases was filed by the Texas Democratic Party. For full disclosure, I have actually brought a separate case filed on behalf of a series of individual young voters. But the case filed on behalf of the Texas Democratic Party alleged a variety of harms, some having to do with age, some having to do with the the medical issues uh, posed by COVID. And they won their case at the trial court. That case went to the Fifth Circuit, and the Fifth Circuit stayed that decision, said basically, we think that the trial court probably got this wrong. So the order that the trial court issued is not going to go into effect immediately because um, we don't think it's right. So in the in the upcoming elections in in uh, Texas, not the November elections, but the more immediate elections in Texas, you still need an excuse. The plaintiffs in that case, which was the Texas Democratic Party, went to the U.S. Supreme Court and asked the U.S. Supreme Court to lift that stay. So they didn't ask the Supreme Court to decide the question of whether the 26th Amendment does or does not uh, guarantee young voters the same rights uh, to vote absentee as older voters. Rather, they asked them the narrow question of, hey, we would like you to lift the block on this going into effect while the Fifth Circuit considers the case, the Fifth Circuit being the Court of Appeals. And the Supreme Court seemingly unanimously said no. We're not going to we're not going to order the stay lifted while the Fifth Circuit continues to consider the case. But one justice, Justice Sotomayor, who, by the way, is a liberal justice and who seems to have voted against the Texas Democratic Party, said, look, I'm not going to lift the stay right now. But I but I hope the Fifth Circuit, the Court of Appeals, considers this issue fully in advance of the November election. So all of this is to say that. Um, the ban in, stays in place for now, but with an opportunity for the Fifth Circuit to consider this question fully, either in the Texas Democratic Party case or in one of the other cases, uh, such as the one that I have filed, and to rule more decisively on the question. And then that case could then be appealed for a discretionary review by the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, where it would have an opportunity to weigh in on the merits of what the 26th Amendment does or doesn't say. So I realize that's a mouthful and a little bit complicated, but I hope that I hope that clarifies. Well, let me ask you, Roger and Anna, Mark. You should know that Roger wants to be able to vote by mail, and uh, so that's exactly what you just talked about. 
you know, I don't get a lot of emails from high school students or recent graduates. So my feeling is that Rajat is probably, as far as uh, knowledge, uh, political knowledge, knowledge of our courts, maybe ahead of most uh, recent high school graduates and Anna as well. How much of what Mark said did you understand? So I think I got most of what you said. I pretty much understood it. Um, my only question for you is, is you mentioned that the Fifth Circuit will determine this case, or at least determine whether or not to lift the stay. Given like the longstanding conservatism of the Fifth Court, doesn't that kind of like put the ball almost in, in like the Republicans' court? Because like that's the most conservative court, or at least from what I understand, the most conservative appeals court in America. They're not going to lift the like, stay. Isn't that They're not going to lift the stay. Mark, Yeah. Like, this was not about the uh, uh, November election, right, Mark? So the the stay was there is as as those of you in texas know there is a july 14th primary election that J- july 14th primary election was the trigger point for most of the litigation we have seen in texas but you know these cases will continue to be litigated for the november election and that's what i think justice sotomayor was saying. In fact, I think she said it explicitly. She said, you know, I hope this is considered fully because the the legal issues are are novel and, uh, you know, compelling that she hopes these are considered on the merits of the case in time for November. So that's what, uh, you know, that's what I know in my case I'm, I'm aiming for. That's what I assume the Texas Democratic Party in their case is aiming for. Um, interestingly, Al, I too got contacted by a high school student. I think it was by Twitter Messenger, actually. And as you might imagine, I get a lot of um, of messages from people who are interested in one way or another in connecting on something. But I got this phenomenally articulate uh, message and then email from one of our plaintiffs who was also, a at that point, a high school senior in Texas um, and was concerned about this very issue. It's laid out in our in our complaint. So I have to say, uh, whatever else Texas is doing, they are certainly teaching civics in their in their high school classes, because uh, it's I, I can say I've never gotten an email or, or or a text or anything from a high school student any place else in America that has led me to file a lawsuit. Well, let me ask um, Anna and, and uh, Rajit, is that the case? Is Texas really doing a good job? Or did that other kid and you guys, are you exceptional? Well, I know that at least in my experience at our high school, our government class was very well taught. I also know that the other government class was rumored to not have been very well taught. So I guess it varies. But I can attest that Rajit <laughs> has actually been one of the people who has really gotten me into activism, civics and politics. Uh, ever since he was in my uh, geography class in freshman year, he was always showing me a different perspective on issues that I never really thought about before, that I never considered. And I think it's great that the influence that our peers can have on us when it comes to activism and things like this. I can't really add anything to that. No, well, you shouldn't. <laughs> you just let that go. The level of engagement is really uh, is really amazing. Are, where are the two of you off to in the fall? I'm headed off to UT Austin. And I'm headed to a actually. <laughs> Excellent. Do you have any idea what that'll look like? Because uh, that's in Texas. Yeah, they're really saying that they want us to come in person yeah. and that they think it's going to all go smoothly. But based <laughs> on the current trends, I'm not too sure if that's really going to come into fruition or not. I'm, I'm not an epidemiologist, but based on what else your governor said would go smoothly, <laughs> I'm not <laughs> sure I would take this to the bank. <laughs> yeah. That, let me ask about that because, okay, basically the rationale, the reason you want to be able to vote by mail is because of COVID, right? Yeah, Absolutely. Okay. Boy, oh boy, that's a legitimate. <laughs> that's a legitimate reason. We're going to talk about vote by mail in a minute. So you'd think that what we've seen over the last few weeks in Texas, after this governor opened up the state and forbade uh, mayors from requiring people to wear masks, that you'd think he'd have a little humility about this. And you'd think that he and the Texas legislature would say, you know what, people should be able to uh, to vote by mail. Is there any movement? In, uh, I think I know the answer to this question, but has has anyone seen any movement on this? No. The, la- the last thing I saw, the state of Texas is standing pat on its, uh, its position on this, which is insane. And it's unconstitutional, by the way, because the whole point of the 26th Amendment 
was to say you don't get to treat some voters worse than other voters based on their age. <laughs> like, uh, that's what the whole amendment was for. <laughs> like, without that, you didn't need the amendment. I was curious. Last night, uh, you were on 60 Minutes, and you had your counterpart there, the Republican counterpart. What's his name? The guy who was on 60 Minutes speaking yeah, for the president. I'm, you can't I'm, remember him? <laughs> That's we never great. actually we never actually met. Okay, okay. I did did not take to him. Well, let's put it that way. <laughs> so, so here's the thing: is that he was asked by the uh, the correspondent from uh, sixty Minutes. Well, the president votes by mail, and he said he votes absentee. What's what's is, he votes absentee by mail, right? <laughs> I I did scratch my head at that, like. You know, in some states it's called absentee. In some states it's called by mail. Um, <laughs> you know, we usually use those terms largely interchangeably. Human beings, you're saying, do that? <laughs> yes, I see. Because I, I, you know, it, how how do you stand it? How do you stand being with these guys? I'm sorry. You know, I have to. The question I was asking myself is like, did he think it went well after the interview? Like, did he go home and was like, oh, wow, I killed that. You know, I explained to them that there's like this distinction. I, I just don't get it. You know, sometimes, sometimes there'll be uh, re Republicans on or conservatives on or lackeys on that are charming. But this guy, no. The problem with the with the Republicans who are, you know, in charge of suppressing the vote is that <laughs> it's like they're constantly having to sort of chase the president down one rabbit hole and another as if he's making any sense. He just says something or tweets something. And the next thing you know, you got a bunch of lawyers being like, oh, yeah, yeah, of course, that's right. That makes perfect sense to me. It's not an easy job being a Republican right now if you're supporting the president, because everybody has to do that. It's not an easy job uh, being you know, Fauci. It's just, that's a really hard job. <laughs> yeah, but this is a hard job for the opposite reason, that he's actually trying, I think, to like, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's <laughs> trying like, to tell the truth. <laughs> yeah, that it makes it even harder. But like, he's like, he's like one of those broadcasters, like during war, where they have to like speak in code. So that the censors <laughs> don't get them. Okay, so, uh, Roger and, and, and Anna, uh, how many of your classmates, how many of your peers care about this? I got to say, at least I, for me that I know, I know of at least 20 kids who are at least interested in politics and interested in mail-in voting and like talk about voter suppression by Republicans, especially in our state, given that we're like a changing, demo, like our state has changing demographics and things like that. People are really getting interested in this. It's really nice to see like, there's this, almost this movement happening where when people live in like a safe state, no one really talks about politics, but we're almost transitioning away from that where we feel like we can make a difference, like our vote will count this time. So voter suppression is starting to feel a lot more oppressive, to put it lightly. Yeah, I mean, it is, it, it's systemic. That's, that's kind of all they do. Well, I guess to put it this way, like, think back like to 2014, height of the Tea Party, Texas was a solid red state. Like we were gung-ho Republican. So there wasn't a lot of like, anger or like frustration about voter suppression because the idea was well democrats are never going to win in the state anyway but after like Bader o'rourke had his victories after all those house victories in texas now we're starting to feel the effects of voter suppression now we're starting to feel wait maybe if we weren't like having our votes suppressed we'd actually be able to win an election so there's almost that kind of tension i see happening right now so you're saying like maybe if people who are eligible to vote were allowed to vote um, you could win. We could win definitely at least more state elections. I'm going to write that down <laughs> because otherwise I'll forget it. Sure, shooting. Okay, if everyone were eligible. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got it. I got it. So, yes, Texas is in play, especially now. Usually, Texas <laughs> breaks our heart. This year, it could be. I don't know if you saw like the election of your favorite senator in the Senate, Ted Cruz, but that was tight. Well, you had a very charismatic candidate against. A guy that no one likes. <laughs> what? Huh? In fact, in fact, I believe you you wrote out that you like him more than most. I did write in my book that I said I probably like Ted Cruz more than almost any of my colleagues, and I hate Ted Cruz. 
<laughs> this was your best shot. You had Beto O'Rourke, who's on fire, and, and hit every county and did everything right. And you had the most uh, sort of uh, despicable, well, not the most, but one of the most despicable people running that no one liked. No one even who's, who likes his politics really actually likes Ted Cruz. That was the best you could do. And it was still, what, two points or point and a half or something? It was a tight election in Texas, which is huge. I don't know how it was outside of the state, but within the state of Texas, it brought a lot of conversations to the forefront. I mean, all of a sudden, it felt like everyone had their own say. It wasn't just, oh, we're going to go with the GOP because that's what we've done. Now it was almost like, okay, people can actually make their own choice. It brought a lot of, a lot of other conversations to the forefront. I don't know if you saw like in the aftermath, on a local level, just more Democrats getting elected down the ballot. Well, I, like that. That, it wasn't the aftermath. It was that, that election, election in absolutely. 2018. Oh, and, and, and Beto's coattails were largely responsible for that. Also, the Republicans <laughs> votes on, on health care and other stuff. But uh, no, Beto should be credited with many of the, the flips there in Texas. Okay, let's talk about the whole issue writ large of are Americans going to be able to vote and what do we need to do between then and now? Mark, you're going to be very, very, very busy. I am very, very, very busy. Um, the Republicans and Donald Trump today sued Pennsylvania, for example, because they are afraid there'll be too much vote by mail. So among their other objections is drop boxes. You know, when people vote by mail, the counties will set up drop boxes so that mm -hmm. people don't have to go in person inside the office to hand off their ballot in the middle of the pandemic. But instead, they can put it in like a secure metal drop box. Like it looks like a mail, old fashioned mailbox, but like, you know, you just put ballots in there. They, they don't like those. <laughs> because they're, they're convenient. <laughs> I, I, apparently, they are objecting to those. How many states now have 100% vote by mail? Uh, six. So Colorado, Washington, Oregon, Utah, and Hawaii have entire vote by mail. Arizona, I say six. Arizona doesn't have entire vote by mail, but but uh, over 80% of the population in Arizona votes by mail. Okay, so they're saying that if people get the vote by mail, there'll be a lot of fraud. But we have six states where people do that. So what's the record on that? What, what evidence can they point to? Really none. Doesn't that hurt their case? <laughs> it does. Um, <laughs> it does. Uh, you know, Your Honor, we have no evidence <laughs> of our theory. We would submit to you our magical thinking. Yeah, I mean, look, this is the argument that they, they make, is that, um, you know, there will be fraud, which is not, you know, supported by the data or by history. It's really supported by Donald Trump's Twitter account, but that's what they're arguing. Of course. You told me when, when I talked to you last, Mark, that um, the best thing people can do is train to be poll workers. Yes. Can you talk to Rajat and Anna, who are afraid <laughs> to go vote, <laughs> the importance of their exposing themselves for hours upon hours? <laughs> uh, to possible uh, contagion. There are two parts to voting, right? There's in-person voting and vote by mail. And vote by mail is increasing. We see the Republican Party fighting against vote by mail. We see Donald Trump, you know, now in court fighting against vote by mail, tweeting about vote by mail. But the other important part of voting is making sure that there's sufficient in-person voting opportunities, including early in-person voting opportunities. So the people who have to or who want to simply prefer to vote in person are able to do so. And the the typical election worker who works behind the desk, works the polls, you know, is is elderly, right? You have two thirds of them over the age of 60 and a quarter of them over the age of 70 in the last election. So there is a huge need for new, younger poll workers to get trained uh, to work election day, because part of being having safe elections and having fair elections is not having the long lines that we've seen in places. And oftentimes those long lines are caused due to the closing of polling locations, which can be done for bad reasons, but sometimes it's done simply because they don't have enough people to staff the polls. So you know, the first thing I tell people when they ask me what they can do is I say, go get trained to be a poll worker and work election day. Because that's that's really, really important. Did you hear that? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I was talking to somebody from the Texas University Democrats at UT Austin, and they strongly recommended becoming a poll worker. 
we noticed that poll workers do interact with a lot more voters than an average voter going to the polls. It seems like a really, really dangerous and obviously it's really admirable, but it also seems really, really risky to do right now. I think that's one of the reasons that we're really pushing mail-in voting is because during a pandemic, people gathering in one place, it, it, it's, it's not a smart decision to make. So I, I take your point about younger people stepping up to do this because we're, we may be healthier, but at the same time, I, I think it'd be preferable if we had even fewer people just at the polling places in general and more people voting by mail or any other ways. It makes sense. And like I said, everyone who wants to vote by mail and can vote by mail should. And I think it's important that we encourage that process. But understand that even in states that have, you know, no excuse absentee voting and relatively easy availability, um, unless you're in a state that has entirely vote by mail, which are the five that I mentioned, plus, you know, to some extent, um, uh, Arizona, you know, if you're in a Michigan or a Wisconsin or a Pennsylvania, you're still going to have large numbers of people voting in person. And we need to make that as safe as possible for everyone. And that means, you know, engaging in the proper protection for poll workers, for sure. It also means, though, that making sure that we don't create more crowds and long lines by having too few poll workers to operate a sufficient number of in-person polling locations. So we're asking you to take one for the team, guys. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I was considering, again, going to become a poll worker, maybe registering. But that is, again, a real concern that I think a lot of younger people have. And I think we've seen in the news, yes, this new pandemic is less deadly to younger people, but especially in the state of Texas, Arizona, and Florida, we've seen a rise in cases, not just amongst older people, but also amongst younger people as well. There, there are a lot of cases of young people, and there's a reason for that, as Dr. Fauci said. I was young once. I'd like to go to a bar, uh, but you can't do that now. <laughs> that was a great impersonation wow it's pretty good i think uh, no one's to blame <laughs> we're not blaming anyone it's not anyone's fault okay but don't do that he said you know you can be asymptomatic but contagious and you young people should know that so that's what's happening in texas is that there's just a lot of young people acting irresponsibly not you guys not you guys uh, but who are acting irresponsibly and they get in fact, they don't even know they're infected and they can give it to somebody who gives it to somebody who maybe is having chemotherapy and something like that. And you, what you have in, in Houston is the uh, ICU units packed full to capacity right now. And I'm not sure how many people your age are among them, but many people your age are probably were part of the chain that got those people sick. That's why what your governor did was insane. And that's why it's insane for him not, uh, for them not to allow uh, mail-in voting. One of our elected officials said something about how we need to go out and vote because we go out and do things all the time. We go out and go to the grocery stores or whatever. And... That, that's kind of their argument is, oh, well, people are doing stuff now. Why can't you go out and vote? Well, theoretically, we should be staying indoors or at least staying socially distanced as much as possible. I feel like there's that kind of disconnect on the state level between, okay, yes, people do have to go out and do things. We understand that, but you want to minimize that. I feel like there's that. Well, not only that, but they have no credibility whatsoever. They created a situation in their state where there's a spike and people are dying and the hospitals are jammed. I mean, the, the idea that they can say anything with a straight face now about this is, is ridiculous. Mark, can you go over just kind of maybe quickly the whole horizon <laughs> of what you're dealing with and what the issues are going to be about uh, whether people can vote? Voter suppression comes in many different varieties. Right now, the, the biggest focus that I have and that most people have are efforts to make voting by mail either impossible. Um, in states, for example, like Texas, it's impossible for large chunks of the population, including Anna and Rajit, because of age. But even in places that allow vote by mail or in places that allow vote by mail for populations that are entitled to it, the hoops that are required sometimes act as uh, just as much of a suppressive agent as if they weren't allowed to vote by mail at all. So we know that, for example, that the ballots of young voters and minority voters are more likely to be rejected in the vote by mail 
verification and sorting process than those of white voters and older voters. And so a lot of the litigation we're bringing right now are under what are referred to as the four pillars, which are to require states to provide free postage, to um, make sure the ballots that are postmarked by election day count, even if they come in afterwards, to allow, um, make sure that signature verification laws don't um, erroneously disenfranchise people without them having an opportunity to contest that uh, and allowing community organizations to collect and uh, return sealed mail ballots, uh, particularly for communities that don't have regular access to mail service. And so we're bringing litigation right now in 17, 18 states on that, plus also dealing with the problems uh, that states are now facing with long lines uh, and uh, increasingly now having to also defend against lawsuits being brought by Republicans. Um, we're defending against a lawsuit that, that the Trump campaign and Republican Party brought in uh, California to try to uh, block mail voting there. Uh, I expect that one form or another will be involved in the Pennsylvania case that uh, got filed today by the Trump campaign. So there's lots going on in this arena. And people keep emailing me and writing and saying, you know, I, Mark, you found your calling. You're so passionate about this. And what I, I think is like, God, how easy is my side of this? Like I wake up every day and think today I'm going to try to make sure that every eligible American has an opportunity to cast their ballot and have it counted. What the hell does the other side wake up thinking they're doing? <laughs> uh, they're going like, today I get to wake up and uh, <laughs> make a lot of money yeah. uh, and uh, keep entrenched interests in power. <laughs> they wake up and they're like, oh, you know what I'm going to do today? There's this this woman named Anna Brooks, let's keep her from voting. <laughs> you know, like, what can we do to keep Anna Brooks and her friends from, from getting their ballots to count? Because um, we're pretty sure how she's going to vote. Because <laughs> we're pretty sure. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I wonder about that all the time, uh, about uh, a, a lot of people. So do you have any questions, you guys, for uh, this is your chance? You got Mark Elias, the lead election lawyer for the uh, Democratic Party in, the, in, in our country. You sent me an email. Here you go. Here it is. Awesome. Well, um, I guess we were talking about like volunteering as a poll worker. What steps do you think states can take to keep poll workers safe? So that way we don't have to worry about acting as vectors and spreading this disease. Yeah, so it's a great it's a great question. One of the things that that states can do, which will make it easier to have sufficient number of poll workers, is to make it so that any registered voter in the state can be a poll worker anywhere in the state. So that you don't have to be a resident of a particular precinct or county, but that if you are a trained poll worker in a state, you can work any polls in the state. The second is that states can operate um, vote centers, so that rather than having to go to the elementary school or the middle school that you're assigned to, you can go to either any polling place in your county or to specially designated large facilities that have lots of space uh, with with multiple uh, tables and sign-in sheets and or sign-in places and the like where anyone from that county can vote. So that's that's good uh, practice even in, in times when there is not a pandemic because it allows more people to vote more quickly, uh, more conveniently, and with fewer people having to interact with one another. Um, but particularly in a time of a pandemic, uh, those two things, allowing greater, easier recruitment of poll workers across jurisdictions um, and also um, uh, vote centers. What's interesting about the, the lawsuit that I mentioned that the Trump campaign and the RNC uh, filed in Pennsylvania is they actually are trying to expand the ability of poll challengers. So rather than trying to, how <laughs> I can't make this up, rather than trying to increase the geography, the geographic footprint that poll workers could come from. They are trying to figure out how to make it easier so that there's a bigger pool of Republican operatives who can 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 challenge people at the polls. So they are suing not to allow poll workers to come from any county, but to allow poll challengers to come from any county. That's <laughs> okay. that's not that's not good. That's the that's 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 not what we want. We want poll workers to be able to come from any. Anna, do you uh, do you have any specific uh, questions? Any any questions at all for for Mark? Sure. So whenever uh, Roger and I were talking about how we might advance the, our campaign for mail in ballot access, uh, we talked about how a big thing that we would need is to get moderate Republicans on our side because of the nature of our state's 
uh, demographics. Would you have any suggestions on how we might be able to approach representatives of that caliber? Well, first you have to find moderate Republicans. <laughs> there, there used to be a fair number of them, but you know, they're they're not so easy to find these days. You can have a scavenger hunt. You won't find what like I can tell you states where you will not find moderate Republicans. Like for example, there are no moderate Republicans in the Senate from say Maine. Any place else, Al, that there are not moderate Republicans? Well, you just identify any Republican <laughs> in the Senate. And they're not a moderate Republican. So, yeah, there's no moderate Republicans anymore. There just aren't. They're, they're gone. It's the party of Trump. And, you know, if, if you have, a, in all seriousness, the Republican Party has become the party of Trump. And so Republicans who used to be moderate Republicans, you see now, you know, have left the party either willingly or unwillingly. Some of them are very courageous. They're running things like the Lincoln Project to educate Republican voters about what Donald Trump is up to. Um, but the ones who have stayed in the party have largely stayed in the party by, by accommodating Trump and his policies. And so it's hard to call any of them moderate Republicans. I think, Anna, that you're more likely to find uh, independents who are moderate and who are very gettable in this election, at least uh, the way the president seems to be handling <laughs> himself in our various crises. There are more, you know, independents than, than ever. Is that true? Am I wrong about that, uh, Mark? Or you're, it, it, By the way, Mark has... Is just a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> he is not, uh, you know, he's he's not a pollster. Nope. He's uh, not a political operative. Nope. He is. He's a lawyer. Yeah. So I I probably that wasn't a good question for him. But uh, my my feeling is is that you're going to have a lot better luck uh, with independence at A and M. By the way, the twenty you said that you had twenty uh, friends who were really. Engaged, is that right, you guys? Well, I have 20 friends who are interested, and so does Anna, knows all these guys as well. We were talking, but as far as like engaged friends that we have, Anna and I only have like maybe 12 people who are like fully engaged in this, maybe 13 or 14. Everyone I would say is interested, everyone wants to make a difference in this, but there's like varying degrees of how much time you're willing to commit to this and things like that. Because we, we, we all have busy lives, this isn't really something, in my personal opinion that teenagers should have to deal with. I was hoping that our elected officials would deal with this, but as far as this is going, there are varying degrees of like interest, but overall there are at least 20 people who are at least somewhat committed. Mark, thank you. You know, Thank you for participating in this podcast once again. Uh, thank you for all your work, good luck. Is there anything you'd like to say to these young people? It sounds like you guys are, are really um, uh, onto the right track. I mean, the fact that you guys are as engaged in voting and making sure that you have voting rights and others have voting rights is is so uh, inspiring that I really can't say enough good things about the two of you. So thank you for everything you're doing. Good luck in college and keep fighting the fight. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was great to meet you and to speak with you. Nice to meet you. Thanks, Mark. Okay. I guess, I guess we're, we're done here. Mark is gone. Good luck to you both. Have a good time. I hope that you can actually go to school and that uh, that's going to be an adventure, I think, and depending on how things are in the fall. But I, I, I hope you're able to go and enjoy college. Thank you. Thank you for speaking with us. That. We really do appreciate this. This is, I, I hate to say it, you're one of the few people that's gotten back to us like, and actually <laughs> to work with us. So I, I really appreciate this. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no one's going to get back here, too. I, I just, I, what you wrote was great, and uh, I admire what you're doing, and you're, you're great people. I was going to say young people, but you're people. Young people are people, too. That's what I like to say. Well, that, that was nice, wasn't it? It gives you hope. It gives you hope. Uh, that music you're hearing, by the way, is from the great... Leo Kotke. Uh, I want to thank Peter Ogburn, my executive producer. Remember to subscribe, damn it, uh, to the podcast. And uh, we'll see you uh, next time here on the Al Franken Podcast. Mm-hmm.